Jacob James Cunningham presiding. Thank you, folks. Good morning, everyone. Please be seated. Good morning, folks. For any of the attorneys that are in the court, would you like to place your, place your appearance on the record? Good morning, Your Honor. Deputy Attorney General Christina Grassi, appearing on behalf of the plaintiff, Governor Whitmer. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. Karen McDonald, Oakland County Prosecutor, appearing on behalf of the defendant, Appellee Jacob James Cunningham. Good morning, Your Honor. Karen McDonald, Oakland County Prosecutor, appearing on behalf of the defendant, Appellee Jacob James Cunningham. Good morning, Your Honor. Karen McDonald, Oakland County Prosecutor, appearing on behalf of the defendant, Appellee Jacob James Cunningham. Good morning, Your Honor. Karen McDonald, Oakland County Prosecutor, appearing on behalf of the defendant, Appellee Jacob all right, thank you, folks. The matter is before the court today on plaintiff's motion for preliminary injunction under MCR 3.310A, requesting the court enjoin defendants from any enforcement of MCL 750.14, commonly referred to as Michigan's criminal abortion statute, pending a resolution to this case on the merits. As a historical background, MCL 750.14 provides that any person who shall willfully administer to any pregnant woman any medicine, drug, substance, or thing, whatever, or shall employ any instrument or other means whatever with intent to thereby pro, uh, procure a, the miscarriage of any such woman unless the same shall be, have been necessary to preserve the life of such woman shall be guilty of a felony and in the case and in the case the death of such pregnant woman be thereby produced the offense shall be deemed manslaughter in any prosecution under this section it shall not be necessary for the prosecution to prove that no such necessity existed the statute applies to all abortion procedures and deems all procedures resulting from abortions as felonious, with the exception of those performed to quote unquote preserve the life of the mother. It is undisputed that the statutory section remains, for lack of a better phrase, quote, still good law, quote, in the sense that it has not been legislatively altered since the inception or, or directly overruled by the courts. The ability of enforcement of MCL 750.14 has only been operational or not based on judicial rulings. This statute is the product of the 57th Michigan legislat Legislative Session, notably comprised almost entirely of men. In 1972, our Michigan Court of Appeals addressed a challenge to MCL 750.14 after a physician was convicted under the statute. See People v. Nixon, 42 Mishap 332, 1972. The Nixon Court addressed Dr. Nixon's challenge to MCL 750.14 as vague in the constitutional sense and because it places an undue restraint upon a physician in the discharge of his professional duties. The Nixon court determined that the state of Michigan had no legitimate interest in prescribing first trimester abortions performed by licensed physicians, id at 339. In 1973, Roe v. Wade was issued by the United States Supreme Court and held that women's fundamental due process rights encompasses a right to abortion. See Roe v. Wade, 410 U.S. 113, 1973 at 153, 155. Roe was controlling until June 24, 2022, when Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization, 957 U.S. unnamed, um, 141 Supreme Court 2619, 2022, overturned Roe. From January 22, 1973, until the Court of Appeals found the instant defendants were not subject to the Court of Claims jurisdiction, and therefore not subject to the preliminary injunction in the Planned Parenthood case, Access to abortion was without question in Michigan until August 1st, 2022. On April 7th, 2022, plaintiff Governor Gretchen Whitmer, on behalf of the state of Michigan, filed suit in this court against 13 county prosecutors requesting declaratory and injunctive relief. The plaintiff relies on our 1963 state constitution, Article 5, Section 8, for the authority to bring such an action. The individual county prosecutor defendants are prosecuting attorneys in counties where abortion services or providers are located. The April 7, 2022 complaint seeks relief under two counts. Under count one, plaintiff contends MCL 750.14 violates the due process clause under Article 1, Section 17 of the Michigan State Constitution, citing the right to bodily integrity, bodily autonomy, and privacy. The court notes during the course of the hearing, plaintiff conceded the right to privacy under Michigan case law, and that issue is therefore not considered today. See Mahaffrey v. Attorney General 222, Mish. App. 325, 1997. Under count two, plaintiff argues that MCL 750.14 violates the equal protection provisions of Article I, Section 2 of the Michigan State Constitution by arguing this, the statute cannot pass constitutional muster as it is a statute which, by its operation, creates a sex-gender-based classification 
without being substantially related to an important governmental objective. On May 17, 2022, the Court of Claims issued a statewide injunction in Planned Parenthood of Michigan v. Attorney General number 22-000044-MM Michigan Court of Claims May 17, 2022. That injunction was issued in part because the Court of Claims determined that if an injunction was not issued, abortion service providers and their patients face a serious danger of irreparable harm, id at 13. On August 1, 2022, the Court of Appeals issued an order providing the Court of Claims preliminary injunction does not apply to county prosecutors. See In Re Jarzenka, Order of the Court of Appeals, issued August 1, 2022, docket number 361470. Thus, following over 18,000 days, or nearly 50 years and multiple generations, reproductive autonomy for women's right to choose whether to bear children in this state was instantly called into uncertainty as enforcement of MCL 750.14 could occur and put providers of abortion and the medical community at odds with its two million actual or potential patients capable of having children. This court then issued a temporary restraining order on August the 1st, 2022 on the request of plaintiff in her official capacity as governor of the state of Michigan restraining defendants, local county prosecutors, from enforcing MCL 750.14. It is undisputed the Court of Claims injunction remains in place as it relates to barring the Attorney General on a statewide level from enforcement of MCL 750.14 today. In this Court's August 1, 2022 order, the Court concluded immediate and irreparable injury will occur if defendant prosecutors are allowed to prosecute abortion providers without a full resolution of the merits of the pending cases challenging MCL 750.14. The court heard in-person oral argument on the testimony restraining order on August 3rd, uh, 2022, and subsequently issued an extension of the temporary restraining order pending an evidentiary hearing on plaintiff's motion to enter a preliminary injunction, CMCR 3.310A. Injunctive relief is an extraordinary remedy and should only be granted when justice so requires. Fancy versus Egrin, 177 Mishap 714, 1989. At the hearing, the party seeking injunctive relief has the burden of establishing that a preliminary injunction should be issued, MCR 3.310A4. Injunctive relief is, quote, an extraordinary and drastic use of judicial power that should be employed sparingly and only with full conviction of its urgent necessity, quote. See Detroit Firefighters Association, local 3344 versus City of Detroit 482 Mish. 18, 2008. Quote, the objective of a preliminary injunction is to maintain the status quo pending a final hearing regarding the party's rights. Quote, Michigan Alliance for Retired Americans versus Secretary of State 334, Mish App 238, 2020. Where a party seeks a preliminary injunction to prevent an alleged status quo violation, it is the concern, as is the concern in the instant case, the party must satisfy a two-step process. First, it bears the burden of establishing a four-part test in favor of the issuance of a preliminary injunction. That is, one, the likelihood that the party seeking the injunction will prevail on the merits. Two, the danger that the party seeking the injunction will suffer irreparable harm if the injunction is not issued. Three, the risk the party seeking the injunction would be harmed more by the absence of the injunction than the opposing party would be by granting the relief. And four, the harm to the public interest if the injunction is issued. See Ask Me Council 25 uh, v. Woodhaven, 293 Mishap 143, 2011. Second, if a trial court determines that the standards for preliminary injunction have been met and chooses to issue an injunction, it must promptly decide the merits of the status quo claim, MCR 3.310A. Subsection 5 requires if a preliminary injunction is granted, the trial of the action on the merits must be held within six months after the injunction is granted unless good cause is shown or the parties stipulate to a longer period. Detroit Firefighters Supra. The court held oral argument on plaintiff's motion for a preliminary injunction in this case on August 17th and 18th, 2022 in open court. The court also limited the number of witnesses and the time allotted for each witness's testimony as well as for argument. The witness's testimony listed at the hearing is preserved for a full trial on the merits, MCR 3.310A2, and the court appreciates all counsel adhering to the court's directives as to the limited evidentiary hearing. In issuing this ruling, the court considers not only the evidence hearing testimony, but also the briefing by the named parties and oral argument from the August 3, 2022 temporary restraining order motion hearing. The court heard from three witnesses proffered by the plaintiff. Those witnesses were Dr. Lisa Harris, Dr. Natasha Bagasarian, and Dr. Diana Norland. 
the court will note some, but not all, pertinent testimony from these witnesses. As an initial matter, the court found all three of these witnesses extremely credible in their testimony and weighs their testimony heavily. See Inri Medina 317, Mish Act 219, 2016. Quote, part of this court's duty as the trier of fact is to assess the weight and credibility of the witnesses and evidence and to determine what weight to allow any inferences. The court, end quote, the court notes defendants in opposition to the preliminary injunction request did not choose to cross-examine these witnesses. Dr. Harris testified regarding her OBGYN career providing emergency care and testified about ending a pregnancy that could harm or kill a person carrying a child. Dr. Harris indicated the concern from her perspective in the medical field generally as to MCL 750.14's provision regarding the uncertainty of, quote, what does it mean to preserve life of the pregnant woman, quote. Dr. Harris testified regarding having no benchmark to determine how a high risk need needs be in order to for her to provide abortion services without being subject to potential criminal liability under MCL 750.14. Dr. Harris testified about the distress of women and medical providers given the recent uncertainty in the law post Roe and specifically in the morning at hours of August 1st 2022 before this court issued its temporary restraining order. She also testified about her concerns about potential liability should should she quote unquote soft send a patient to a jurisdiction where abortion services remain intact, indicating a concern of, as it was put during closing arguments, quote, aiding and abetting. Dr. Bogdasarian is the chief medical executive of the state at the Department of Health and Human Services. She testified as to the public health concerns, vulnerable population impact, and the concerns of the state in providing medical guidance as required by her job, given the uncertainty of how MCL 750.14, if applicable, would impact the medical community. She also testified regarding statistics of abortion in our state. Most notable to the court, abortions in Michigan are overwhelmingly safe for the person receiving the abortion care, statistically more safe than pregnancy itself, that most abortion patients are already, are already mothers, suggesting either dire medical reasons for seeking an abortion or due to the financial constraints of having more children than one could care for, and that 90% of procedures occur within the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. Dr. Norland, the third witness, notably is both a doctor and lawyer. The court highly credits his testimony for having the appropriate intersection of both medical and legal knowledge in this area. Dr. Norland also lives in a county where one of the defendants, in opposition to the plaintiff's request, has acknowledged he may seek to enforce MCL 750.14 if able to do so. Excuse me. Notable to the court was Dr. Norland's testimony that the term miscarriage, the term used in MCL 750.14, is a medical term of art. She testified in her opinion MCL 750.14 creates a question as to what exactly is the medical standard of care in relation to quote unquote procuring a miscarriage. For example, in her opinion, an eptopic pregnancy, which will not result in the birth of a child from a medical standpoint, poses a great risk of of death to the mother and requires treatment to end the pregnancy. The statute at question creates a medical legal uncertainty on the standard of care in those unfortunate situations which subject medical professionals to chilling repercussions from civil suits, loss of medical licensing, and of course under MCL 750.14 felony prosecution, all while their patient faces extreme health considerations including death. Dr. Norland testified these considerations would naturally naturally be required to be considered by a provider before they could care for their patient should MCL 750.14 be in effect. Defendants in opposition to the plaintiff's request for a preliminary injunction proffered two witnesses, Dr. Priscilla Coleman and Dr. Gianna Kazan London. Dr. Coleman was deemed an expert in the area of, psycholo of psychology of abortion decision making and mental health outcomes, MRE 702. The decision to continue to deem Dr. Coleman an expert for purpose of trial is reserved as discussed on the record. Dr. Coleman testified extensively about her research and publications regarding the mental health impact to women who have received abortions. On cross-examination, in the court's eyes, Dr. Coleman's credibility was seriously called into question, and her statistics and conclusions of her testimony reveal unhelpful and biased information for the court's instant inquiry. Notable was Dr. Coleman's indication that although there were, quote-unquote, very few psychological studies on instances of rape or incest resulting in birth, she nevertheless concluded, stunningly, that only 20% of those mothers harbor resentment toward that child. 
When questioned regarding peer criticism of her own work, Dr. Coleman alluded to bias and pro-choice interest groups being the issue, not empirical problems with her own methodology, which, not lost on the court, included one meta-analysis where an overwhelming amount of data was, in fact, her own. Specifically, testimony established that 22 studies were aggregated in the metadata study. Of those 22, 11 were authored by the witness and only 14 data sets were used. Presumably, the testimony revealed 11 of, them, 11 of them created by the witness herself. Dr. Coleman's testimony is dismissed as not credible in a practical sense, completely called into question during cross-examination, nor helpful in assisting the court in weighing the factors for defeating plaintiff's request for a preliminary injunction. The court affords her testimony no weight. The final witness was Dr. Kazan London. As an initial matter, the court thanks Dr. Kazan London for her military service to our country. Dr. Kazan London testified regarding her care for pregnant persons, mainly for high-risk pregnancy, and her one experience in assisting an abortion procedure. She testified at length about how she looks for abnormalities of the fetus in order to assist the patients with a care plan. On cross-examination, Dr. Kazan London was significantly discredited in the court's mind regarding a personal bias in this area. The court also observed her demeanor significantly changed, including the tenor of her voice on cross-examination versus on direct examination. Notable to the court was the inability for Dr. Kazan London to acknowledge from the court's perspective the impact of rape and a subsequent pregnancy on a victim testifying, uh, on a victim testifying that all births, even if the result of rape, are simply quote unquote, part of womanhood. Dr. Kazan London's testimony is dismissed as not credible in a practical sense, completely called into question during cross-examination, nor helpful in assisting the court weighing the factors for defeating plaintiff's request for preliminary injunction. The court affords her testimony no weight for purposes of the evidentiary hearing. Turning to the law. To prevail today, plaintiff must demonstrate entitlement to a preliminary injunction, um, in this case, as to all four elements required under case law. See Ask Me Supra. First, plaintiff must demonstrate the likelihood of success on the merits. In the absence of controlling federal law following Dobbs, as Judge Glacier noted in her opinion in Planned Parenthood, an initial question likely to be of interest to our state citizen, citizenry is the power of the state court to interpret Michigan's Constitution differently than the United States Supreme Court interprets the federal Constitution. The Supreme Court has found, quote, state courts are absolutely free to interpret state constitutional provisions to accord greater protection to individual rights than do similar provisions of the United States Constitution, quote, Florida versus Powell, 559 U.S. 50, 2010. In fact, our state Supreme Court has held, quote, it is this court's obligation to independently examine our state's constitution to ascertain the intentions of those in whose name our constitution was ordained and established, quote, see People versus Tanner, 496, Mish 199, 2014. Michigan's Constitution Due Process Clause need not be interpreted in lockstep with the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause. Quote, although these provisions are often interpreted coextensively, our state constitution, Article 1, Section 17 may, in particular circumstances, afford protections greater than or distinct from those offered by the U.S. Constitution, uh, Constitutional Amendment 14, Section 1. Quote, AFT Michigan versus uh, Michigan 497 Mish 197, 2015. For Holland Home versus Grand Rapids, 219 Michiat, 384, 1996, quote, this court is not constrained to adopt the United States Supreme Court's analysis of the constitutionality of abortion under the United States Constitution, but must instead focus its inquiry on the rights and guarantees conferred by our state constitution, end quote. And in the recent decision in Dobbs, the United States Supreme Court has invited, if not demanded, the state specifically address the issue of constitutionality the constitutionality of protected abortion access to its citizens. Here, plaintiff is demonstrated by virtue of the language of MCL 750.14, a concerning and cognizable constitutional crisis as it relates to the medical profession and the women and persons capable of bearing children, including some transgendered men. The notions of bodily autonomy and integrity, due process and equal protection have all been noted by the briefing and testimony suggesting overwhelmingly that MCL 750.14 as it currently provides will be stricken in its entirety at maximum or in part at minimum. As the court will discuss later, there is also a proposed constitutional amendment likely to be presented to the electorate in the upcoming general election, which would significantly add abortion access in Michigan as a constitutional right if passed. As currently applied, the court finds the, state, uh, the statute dangerous and chilling to our state's population of childbearing people and the medical professionals who care for them. 
In Mays v. Governor of Michigan, 506 Mish 157, 2020, our Supreme Court held that, quote, plaintiffs pleaded a, cogn a recognizable due process claim under Michigan's Constitution for a violation of their right to bodily integrity, quote. The Supreme Court has additionally found, quote, the right to one's person may be said to be a right of complete immunity to be let alone, quote, citing Cooley Torts, uh, Cooley and Torts 29, Union uh, Pacific Railroad versus Botsford 141 U.S. 250, 1891. Subjecting providers to criminal penalty for medical care that was available, not to mention safe, as the testimony suggested, safer than pregnancy itself, without any justification from the state for doing so, simply does not pass constitutional muster under our state's constitution. Women and all persons capable of caring children not having the ability and freedom to consult with their medical professionals without fear of prosecution puts the government into the patient examining room. A person carrying a child has the right to bodily autonomy and integrity, as well as a safe doctor-patient relationship free from government interference, as they have been able to do so for nearly 50 years. Weaponizing the criminal law against providers to force pregnancy on our state's women is simply contrary to notions of due process, equal protection, and bodily autonomy in this court's eyes. The complete disparity that this statute criminalizes providers and chills their ability to care for their childbearing patients, who are then left without resource, all the while ignoring that a man, even potentially a rapist, who is by definition a required component to the scenario we discussed today, is totally left out of liability under MCL 750.14. This too is contrary to basic notions of constitutionality and equal protection. The court briefly questions, for purposes of example only, what would the argument surrounding an equal protection, liberty, bodily autonomy, and bodily integrity argument that would be presented should mandatory vasectomy be at issue today in lieu of child gestation and birth? What if men were required to be unable, by statute and threat of criminality, to seed children until they could satisfy to their medical professional that they were capable to assist in the raising, supporting, nurturing, and education of a child? Imagine the response to that scenario. This court having had the benefit of presiding over a family court docket where child support, contested paternity actions, and child abuse neglect matters um, that were highly litigated and contentious raises the issue merely to highlight that matters surrounding government intrusion on the basis of sex and gender in relation to childbearing people and the decision to have or not to have a child overwhelmingly affects women and not men disproportionately. All the while society is fully aware both parties are required to engage in the a type of behavior that produces the factual scenario we discussed today. It is clear to the court that only one group is harmed by this statute, women and people care, capable of care, carrying children, and one group, men peop, and people capable of impregnating someone, have zero culpability or risk, yet are a necessary component to this equation. As it is also clear the surreptitious avenue to avoid an equal protection allegation that the statute targets providers and not people is an obvious smokescreen which should not pass constitutional scrutiny. Plaintiff has therefore satisfied this prong of the analysis and the court finds there's a strong likelihood that plaintiff will prevail in whole or in part in challenging the constitutionality of the now existing language and near total abortion ban prohibited under MCL 750.14 at trial. Next, the court must look at the danger that the parties seeking the injunction will suffer irreparable harm if the injunction is not issued. Though defendants in opposition to the matter before the court take issue with the notion the governor brought this action, quote, on behalf of the state, quote, and that therefore, they argue, the request fails ad initio on jurisdictional grounds, the court disagrees. First, as previously discussed regarding the nature of the underlying complaint, the state constitution provides the governor with the authority to bring suit on behalf of the state. In viewing the request during the evidentiary hearing as, quote unquote, the state, and therefore its citizenry, the danger of harm to, quote unquote, the plaintiff could not be more crystal clear. Like a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, our state is only as strong as its most vulnerable and at-risk populations. Criminalization of our medical professionals for treating the women seeking appropriate, safe, constitutionally protected medical care is an irreparable danger to our society at large. By threatening physicians with criminality to the extent they would in turn diminish or refuse care, even be subject to aiding and abetting for seeking out-of-state care for a patient, puts the burden on the, on the approximately two million Michigan citizens capable of pregnancy in extreme, untenable risk. 
To satisfy defendant's concerns about the proper party of interest in, in this respect, the court answers, it's everyone, individually and collectively, and the request made in the instant complaint is appropriately brought by the head of the executive branch. Second, as previously discussed, the court reiterates concerns that the party seeking the injunction, i.e. the people of the state, would suffer irreparable harm if the injunction is not issued. But to highlight, regardless of anyone's closely held personal, medical, or religious beliefs, we trust our medical professionals to first do no harm. To impose criminality under MCL 750.14, as previously mentioned, thus denying care, preventing care, thwarting care, or deferring care to a more favorable jurisdiction squarely contradicts our medical professionals' duties, oaths, and a standard of medical care. The very real danger of death, serious injury, infertility, abuse, forced pregnancy, poverty, etc., all testified at the evidentiary hearing, all stem from imposition of the statute at bar against the medical community to their patients. The harm to the body of, the body of women and people capable of pregnancy in not issuing the injunction could not be more real, clear, present, and dangerous to the court. The plaintiff has met its burden, demonstrating the second prong is also met. Next, the court considers whether the risk to the party seeking the injunction would be harmed more by the absence of the injunction than, opposing, than the opposing party would be by granting the relief. As the court has already discussed the harm to the state and its citizenry at length in the previous discussions, the court will focus now on the harm to defendants by granting the relief. From the court's perspective, there is precisely zero harm to the defendants by granting a preliminary injunction, zero. Defendants suffer precisely no harm from the court preventing them from enforcement of a statute that save for a handful of hours on August the 1st, 2022, they were otherwise unable to prosecute since 1973, should an injunction issue today. The option to investigate and prosecute alleged criminality under the guise of MCL 750.14 was never a viable option until recent developments and waiting until the conclusion of this case uh, to, and waiting until the conclusion of this case to do so is simply put the ultimate example of maintaining the status quo and precisely why courts are expressly vested with the ability to, with caution and careful consideration, to grant extraordinary preliminary injunctive relief. At maximum, trial on the merits of this case by court rule will, will occur within six months. To argue defendants suffer any harm given these facts is simply contrary to sound reason and logic. If, at the conclusion of this case, the court finds MCL 750.14 is constitutional, in whole or in part, defendants will be free to prosecute, with the great governmental resources available to them, the crime they wish to exercise their prosecutorial discretion to investigate today. And if MCL 750.14 is ultimately upheld, in whole or in part, at the conclusion of this case, defendants have a six-year statute of limitations for which they can retroactively investigate in their prosecutorial discretion violations of the statute. Conversely, should they be allowed to prosecute under MCL 750.14 today, and tomorrow our Supreme Court finds the statute unconstitutional, or the proposed constitutional amendment nullifies MCL 750.14, there will be providers who could be charged with felonies that will result in loss of their liberty if incarcerated, and livelihood if they lose their medical license. The number of women impacted under this scenario, whether forced to give birth or to relocate to seek medical care, suffer irreversible uterine damage from an un uh, untreated uh, ectopic pregnancy, to name a few plausible of many horrific outcomes, is unquantifiable for purposes of this scenario. In light of the fact this court finds no harm whatsoever to the defendants in being enjoined from being able to enforce this one particular statute, given the nature of these proceedings, the court suggests the county prosecutors focus their attention and resources in the meantime to investigation and prosecution of criminal sexual conduct, homicide, arson, child and elder abuse, animal cruelty, and other violent, horrific crimes that we see in our society, that they are fully capable of investigating and prosecuting, all while being enjoined from enforcement of MCL 750.14. As the court noted on August 3, 2022, the county prosecutors are also free to exercise their discretion to prosecute under MCL 750.30, the crime of adultery, also a felony, which as far as this court is aware, has been declined to be prosecuted in any Michigan jurisdiction in all of recent memory. The plaintiff has satisfied this prong as well. Finally, the court must weigh the harm to the public interest if the injunction is issued. As previously discussed, the harm to the public only stems from not issuing an injunction here. Though the court appreciates both sides of this debate are passionate in their convictions, 
By not issuing an injunction today, the court would send the health care system into crisis, the extreme costs of which would then be put on the women of our great state and not lost on the court without any repercussion for the men who, without a doubt, are a necessary component to create a pregnancy. As a final note which weighs in favor of granting a preliminary injunction, the court must acknowledge that on August 31st, our State Board of Canvassers will meet and inform us whether a constitutional amendment will be on the ballot which could render this case moot. Though challenges to the proposed amendment are being brought, it appears a substantial, historical number of signatures have been submitted in favor of having the matter, um, that being reproductive autonomy, placed on the November general election ballot. The ultimate expression of political power in this country comes not from the branches of our government and those that serve as public officials in them, but from the people, the citizens who vote and participate in our fair and free electoral process. In just 81 days, on November 8, 2022, it is likely the citizens will decide this matter one way or another. Not lost on the court during the hearing on August 3, 2022, was defendants uh, in opposition in this case argument that this court must follow stare decisis, that is, follow precedent as it is. Though it appears the instant matter comes to this court due to a departure from de stare decisis, this court acknowledges it is bound by precedent. In that vein, Dobbs defers the matter of abortion rights to the states, and in this court finds it is overwhelmingly in the public's interest to let the people of the great state of Michigan decide this matter at the ballot box, assuming the Constitutional Amendment initiative is on the ballot on November 8th. Therefore, and for all these reasons, the court grants a preliminary injunction in this case, MCR 3.310A. Uh, in light of the likelihood of the matter being decided in the upcoming election, the court sets a pretrial conference required by court rule for November 21st, 2022 at 9.30 a.m. The court will set a trial date at which, which will occur by court rule no later than February 19th, 2023, if needed. Until further order of this court, defendants are hereby enjoined from enforcement of MCL 750.14 in all respects. The court finds the unique circumstances of this case, the procedural and factual predicate, the risks associated to the public compel judicial intervention of this magnitude. As a final note, the court reminds the public that the final day to register to vote is October the 24th, 2022. Thank you, folks. That's all. All right. Thank you.